Hanle um boki he on lapi oyate le nach on pekele na on ke apie na le makhot chum ki trape kele na on ki chimpi tanko on ki trape kele na hekta ke la khota ke on ki chimpi chavo ke he on ichilape We are the matriarchal Tichuan Lakota Oyate of the Ocheti Chacoan, an indigenous First Nation people of Turtle Island, the continent known as North America. In togetherness with our buffalo relatives, the Tatanka Oyate, we once roamed freely across the vast prairies and hills of the Northern Great Plains until the occupation of these lands by the expanding United States Empire. Born over thousands of years, our sacred way of life taught us to live, love, and thrive, qualities that endure in our survival today. As we move beyond seven generations in our unyielding struggle to resist genocide, our matriarchal grandmothers are taking back their strength once again. In togetherness with Lakota warriors and people, we speak out for accountability and change to end the atrocities that keep us from healing our nation. Only by understanding our story can our people live free once again. To our relatives from the four directions, we ask you to listen, not only with your ears, but with your hearts. From the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the place you know as South Dakota, this is our story. We did not ask you, white men, to come here. We do not want your civilization. We would live as our fathers did, and their fathers before them. In 1492, the indigenous Arawak people of the Caribbean islands encountered Christopher Columbus of Spain. Columbus wrote in his log, they would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Columbus proceeded to unleash a reign of terror unlike anything seen before. When he was finished, 8 million Arawaks, virtually the entire native population of Hispanolia, had been exterminated by torture, murder, forced labor, starvation, disease, and despair. Columbus's atrocities with cross and sword were justified by the Christian doctrine of divine discovery and set religious and legal precedent for the invasion and genocide of America's indigenous peoples for the next 500 years and beyond. By 1650, a precarious relationship between the First Nations of the East Coast of North America and New England colonists was collapsing into slaughter and enslavement of native people by settlers who wanted more land and wealth. We find that most of the English colonies sanctioned and encouraged scalping Indians. In 1776, the United States birthed the first 13 states on land taken through the ethnic cleansing of dozens of eastern seaboard tribes. The Declaration of Independence further enshrined the belief of Euro-American settler supremacy by declaring native peoples to be merciless Indian savages. In 1787, the United States adopted its constitution. Article 6 established treaties as the supreme law of the land. Despite this supreme law, treaties with sovereign native nations became slippery promises, easily broken when convenient. In 1823, in the case of Johnson and Graham Lessie v. McIntosh, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the First Nation people's right of occupancy was subordinate to the United States' divine right of discovery. The United States has unequivocally agreed that discovery gave an exclusive right to extinguish the Indian title of occupancy. This landmark ruling provided legal cover for governmental policies that would claim white Euro-Christian supremacy as justification for stealing indigenous lands and for the genocide of native peoples. In 1849, the California Gold Rush triggered the mass Western migration of settlers, putting them in direct conflict with existing indigenous nations. 
In 1851, anxious to protect white settlers on their way to California and to avoid a full-scale war with the Lakota and our allies, the United States requested the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Sioux and other northern Great Plains nations. Six Sioux men signed the treaty which recognized the Lakota nation's sovereignty over a vast territory amounting to approximately 5% of the continental United States. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, the United States sent its war-hardened soldiers on a crusade to settle the West. Led by the growing dogma of manifest destiny, the U.S. claimed the God-given right to expand its borders from sea to shiny sea. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill them. In 1868, unable to defeat the warriors of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations fighting to protect our lands and people, for the first time in its history, the United States appealed for peace and drafted the Second Treaty of Fort Laramie. The treaty established the Great Sioux Reservation, including the Black Hills and unceded Indian Territory, to be set apart for the absolute and undisturbed use and occupation of the Indians, and that no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy any portion of the Indian Territory. Unable to defeat our free Lakota people with military might, the U.S. government increased the use of deceptive practices to subvert our matriarchal system and to create the appearance of agreement when our lands and rights were stolen. It is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts, and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromise can be made. Just three years later, in 1871, the U.S. government ceased to recognize Indian nations as sovereign and independent with the passage of the Indian Appropriation Act. This legislation legalized the theft of our treaty-protected lands and further threatened our way of life with our buffalo relatives. The civilization of the Indians is impossible while the buffalo remain upon the plains. The mass slaughter of our buffalo relatives, the Tatanko Ayate, lasted from 1871 until 1910. In just the first seven years, buffalo hunters decimated the great herds of buffalo nearly to extinction. The U.S. Army encouraged the slaughter by providing free ammunition and supplies. In 1873 alone, buffalo hunters massacred more than 1.5 million buffalo. As planned, our people became increasingly dependent on the U.S. government for even the most basic of human needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. In 1874, after illegally trespassing on Lakota territory, General George Custer publicly announced the discovery of gold in the Pahasapa, the Black Hills. As intended, the announcement unleashed a flood of miners and prospectors into the Great Sioux Reservation in violation of the 1868 Treaty. In 1875, the U.S. demanded we sell the entire Black Hills region. We refused. The U.S. declared this an act of war and launched a massive invasion of our lands to annihilate our people. Nothing short of their annihilation will get the Black Hills from them. On the 25th of June, 1876, in the Battle of the Greasy Grass, or Little Bighorn, the Sioux Nation, along with our Cheyenne and Arapaho relatives, won a great victory over General Custer and the elite 7th Cavalry. On that day, we defeated the might of the U.S. Army and took their flag. Seeking revenge for their defeat, the U.S. Army directed Colonel Randall McKenzie to unleash total war. U.S. forces went from village to village, killing women, children, and ponies, and destroying teepees, clothing, blankets, and food supplies. The U.S. then launched a sell-or-starve policy and withheld rations to coerce our people to sell the Black Hills and to relinquish our sovereign rights. These inhuman atrocities forced the surrender of many Lakota people to the U.S. agencies by spring of 1877. 
despite being on the brink of starvation, few of our people signed the agreement to cede the Black Hills. When the paper was signed by Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and others to give up the Black Hills, the majority of the Indians of the Teton Sioux tribe were not there, and they never consented to giving up the Black Hills, and never gave those chiefs permission or authority to sell or give up the Black Hills. Unable to obtain the required three-fourths consent, the U.S. seized the Black Hills with an act of Congress, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Incensed by the illegal seizure, negotiator for the U.S. Henry Benjamin Whipple wrote, I know of no other instance in history where a great nation has so shamefully violated its oath. Our country must forever bear the disgrace and suffer the retribution of its wrongdoings. Our children's children will tell the sad story in hushed tones and wonder how their fathers dared so to trample on justice and trifle with God. After breaking treaties, seizing native lands, and destroying our system of life, the U.S. government introduced another element of the genocide of Turtle Island's indigenous people, assimilation. Kill the Indian, save the man. In the 1880s, the U.S. government joined forces with Christian and Catholic missionaries to steal native children, as young as two years old, from their families ship them to schools far away, burn their clothes, and cut their hair, deprive them of loving family contact for years, and use mental and physical abuse to force their assimilation into American society and the Christian religion. There are but two goals for the Indians, civilization or annihilation. In 1883, the U.S. created the Code of Indian Offenses to criminalize our culture and spiritual practices such as the sun dance, the giveaway, gifts for the bride, feasts, and medicine men. Punishments included fines, hard labor, imprisonment, and withheld rations. In 1885, the U.S. Congress continued its assault on tribal sovereignty by passing the Major Crimes Act which unilaterally extended U.S. jurisdiction over major crimes into sovereign Lakota territory. In 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation into individual parcels of privately owned property assigned to tribal members. Our people had no concept of individual ownership of our Mother Earth. The Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say I instead of we, and this is mine instead of this is ours. Two years later in 1889, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, the U.S. Congress passed an act to divide the Great Sioux Reservation into five separate and smaller reservations, including the Pine Ridge Reservation. The U.S. government opened the remaining 11 million acres of Sioux Treaty territory for public purchase, including sacred sites and burial grounds our people used for thousands of years. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. By 1890, our Lakota people, once powerful and free, were entirely dependent on the U.S. government. The U.S. had forcibly removed our people from our homeland, confined them to reservations, cut their rations by half, stolen our children, and decimated the great herds of our buffalo relatives. On the 29th of December, 500 soldiers of the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment surrounded Bigfoot's band of about 350 Lakota people at Wounded Knee Creek, and along with four rapid-fire Gatling guns, massacred 312 of our men, women, and children. Our people know Wounded Knee as a massacre. The U.S. government calls it a battle. 
23 U.S. troops were awarded the Medal of Honor. Something else died here in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dreams died here. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. In 1903, the U.S. Supreme Court decision Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock secured U.S. hedge money over indigenous peoples by granting Congress unlimited authority to break Indian treaties unilaterally, to sell treaty-protected land, and to regulate all aspects of Indian affairs without the consent of indigenous nations. In 1934, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA. In a misguided attempt to fix the indigenous nations the U.S. deliberately had broken, Despite opposition from traditional elders and in violation of the 1868 treaty, John Collier, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and Harold Ix, Secretary of Interior, illegally approved the IRA Oglala Sioux Tribal Council and Constitution for the Pine Ridge Reservation with the support of only 1,348 tribal members out of an estimated 12,000 Oglala Lakota people. Most of our people were ineligible unable or unwilling to cast a vote. In the 1960s and 70s, U.S. Indian Health Services, IHS, physicians performed involuntary sterilizations on thousands of Lakota women aged 15 to 44. IHS facilities singled out full-blood Lakota women for sterilization procedures. On the 27th of February, 1973, 300 American Indian movement activists from more than 75 tribes began occupying Wounded Knee, the site of the massacre 83 years earlier. Traditional elders from Pine Ridge sought to exercise our people's natural right to sovereignty and to take a stand against the corruption of the illegal Oglala Sioux tribe government. Continuing the 150-year war on the Lakota people, federal authorities escalated the occupation of Wounded Knee into armed conflict with a force of U.S. Marshals, FBI agents, National Guard personnel, armored personnel carriers mounted with machine guns, snipers and helicopters, semi and fully automatic assault rifles, grenade launchers, tear gas, jets for aerial photographs, and paramilitary personnel. The occupation ended after 71 days when a local Lakota man was killed by a federal sniper and both sides agreed to disarm. From 1973 to 1976, in the aftermath of the Wounded Knee takeover, the U.S. government backed Oglala Sioux Tribe President Dick Wilson and his guardians of our Oglala Nation paramilitary vigilante force, nicknamed Goons, inflicted the reign of terror on Pine Ridge. More than 60 grassroots activists, traditional full-blood Lakota people, and our supporters were assassinated. 300 were harassed and beaten. 562 were arrested, of which only 15 were convicted of crimes. During that time, the murder rate on the Pine Ridge Reservation soared to 170 per 100,000, the highest in the world at that time. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the 1877 seizure of the Black Hills was illegal, but did not return the land to our people, offering money instead. To this day, we refuse to accept the monetary compensation offered for the theft of sacred Bahasapa. In 2000, at a ceremony acknowledging the 175th anniversary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Assistant Secretary of the BIA, Kevin Gover admitted. From the very beginning, the Office of Indian Affairs was an instrument by which the United States enforced its ambition against the Indian nations and the Indian people who stood in its path. It must be acknowledged that the deliberate spread of disease, the decimation of the mighty bison herds, the use of the poison alcohol to destroy mind and body, and the cowardly killing of women and children 
made for tragedy on a scale so ghastly that it cannot be dismissed as merely the inevitable consequence of the clash of competing ways of life. Though he described the multitude of ways the U.S. government has devastated indigenous peoples and nations, he failed to admit the truth. Genocidal warfare continues today. So, past, present, future, you exist, the body changes. Is it not clear? That's, that's clear. Uh, yeah. So therefore, the conclusion that when he'll not have this body, he'll have another body. You are sitting here. If you don't sit here, you go. That does not mean you are sitting. Uh, mm, opportunity is lost. You are sitting here. You sit somewhere. Similarly, the change of body is going on. Therefore, the conclusion is that after you give up this body, you will have another one as you have already done. What is the difficulty to understand? The seeming difficulty is that one, um, while the body is different from that of a bull. A different body must be different, therefore that is called change of body. Unless it is a different body, what is the change? The memory is there, the boy. Mm -hmm. And or the the spirit is there. Mm -hmm. The memory. Sometimes we may not remember. Uh, just like your this child, he may not have memory when he was very small, but you have got memory. You know, when he was a small child, you are doing something or some do. He was playing with some cats and dogs, but he does not remember that. But you remember it. So, simply because he has forgotten, does that mean that the incidences were not present? So this argument is not very strong, because I cannot remember. You do not remember so many things. Huh? But the fact is this, that you are changing from this body to this body to this body. Therefore the conclusion should be, that after this body I will accept another body. And that's the fact. As you have accepted in this life from one body to another body, there is a process how to accept it. Similarly, under the same process, you accept another body when this body is no longer useful. Uh, just like at night, you give up this body, you take your subtle body and you go to somewhere. You are sleeping at, in your room, but you are working in a different place. Don't you do that? Mm -hmm. So, because the, this body is still useful, therefore you come to work again this body, and in the morning you wake up with this body. So death means when this body is useless, you do not come to this body, you accept another body. This is called death.
that subtle body takes you from this body to the umba of another mother by nature's direction that this soul shall get this kind of body. So the soul is entered uh, in the womb of another mother's body. And then the body is prepared by the mother's blood and flesh. And when the body is sufficiently capable of working itself, then it comes down, comes again and begins his work. This is birth and death. The soul is eternal. Therefore, a sober man should think, why should I change my body? Why this trouble I shall take? That is human sense. When if I am eternal, why not my eternal body? Eternal existence, why shall I die? This is human sense. Unless one comes to this understanding, is animal. Because animal, by nature's law, is going on. He does not know. Then a human form of body, when he understands that I'll have to change this body, I'll have to get another body, then the question is, what kind of body I shall get? Uh, that is human intelligence. By nature's way, we are getting body, but that is on the selection of the nature according to my work. If I work like animal, I get animal body. If I work as demigod, I get demigod body. If I act as trees, uh, then you get tree body. If you acted like dog, you get dog's body, nature's way. Uh, therefore you find so many varieties of body. This philosophy does not appeal. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you founded the Hare Krishna movement some seven years ago in 1967, did you not? Yes. Uh, in a capsule, what is the movement? Uh, the movement is to awaken God consciousness of the human being. The uh, human being is distinct distinguished from the animals, that the animals cannot understand what is God. Mm -hmm. And if the human being also uh, does not understand what is God, then he is animal. I see. And so your movement is to bring about an understanding of God yes. among human beings. Yes. And Hare Krishna means what? Hare Krishna means addressing uh, the energy of God. Hare means the energy of God, and Krishna means God. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you were here yesterday and to attend your annual festival that yeah. was held here in Golden Gate Park, and we were there too, mm. and in fact, here it is. Mm. Um, a few thousand people uh, came out to hear it. How many people are now uh, disciples um, of the Krishna Consciousness Movement? Uh, dedicated life, about 10,000. About 10,000 dedicated In the ones. Western world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Your Grace, is there any significance in all, at all in the shaved head? Why are heads shaved? Uh, we keep ourselves very clean, that's all. Oh, it's just a cleanliness thing? Yes. Is there any significance in the color uh, as, of the at robe? Least, at least uh, at the present moment, people think that uh, by keeping long hair, it becomes very beautiful. I see. Yes. 
So we are against them. Mm -hmm. Just as simple as that. <laughs> is there any significance in the yellow robes? Uh, yellow robe uh, is the dress those who are dedicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that, that is, that it is, it could very well have been a blue robe. It's oh, just yeah. something that, that, that was arrived this, at. The, this um, saffron. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Your Grace, why do you feel that so many people are pulling away from the traditional religions in this country, such as Christianity and so forth, and going uh, for the uh, trying to understand the Eastern religions? We hear a lot of swamis and gurus and mm -hmm and uh, other type of um, yogi and so forth. Why do you feel that people are pulling away from the traditional Christian standards here? But uh, we, we see that the um, Christian churches, especially I've seen in London, mostly closed. People are not interested, or the Christian leaders, they cannot make them interested. Why? Did Christianity fail the people, which is why they're turning to other things? Or? I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say that Hare Krishna consciousness uh, pretty much takes the absolute truths from the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, mm -hmm. and the Vedic. Yeah, everywhere. Everywhere. Reli religion means to understand God. I understand, but do you feel that in, in getting truths from various places like the Bible and the Quran and so forth, don't you run into conflicts at all or contradictions in those particular philosophies? No, I don't find any conflict because the ultimate goal is God. So you have to understand God and try to love Him. So you can go through any religious process. If the goal is attained, that you understand what is God and you try to love Him, then your life is perfect. Why do we see so many of your followers chanting um, yeah. almost all the time? Chanting means to keep association with God always. So you have to audibly chant yes. Hare Krishna? Yes. This is, this is uh, transcendental, transcendental vibration. Just like a uh, radio message, if you keep contact with the radio message, mm -hmm. uh, then you know everything what is going on outside. Similarly, and this transcendental sound, Hare Krishna, if you chant, then you keep connection with God directly. Thank you very much, um, Your Divine Grace. It's Thank been you. our privilege to, to talk with you and to meet you. Thank you. And hope that we can see you again when you return. Hare Krishna. We'll be back with more news in just a moment. <laughs> Deva treating Hajatos at Deva. Deva treating Hajatos at Deva. Mandi Buddha, she turned on her in 